I mean, so I'll, I'll try to take this at a, a leisurely pace, and I mean, it ramps up. Uh, I made this presentation not explicitly for a technical audience, so that interested just lay do people it, do it can do however it. you would like to do oh, it. Oh, no, I'm just, well, <clears throat> for the for the record, I'm saying that so that people have some oh, idea. Oh, okay, so you're right? recording. So, right yeah, no, I'm starting. I'm starting. Oh, good, so. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so I've called this for now particles or not particles, and, and what I'm really talking about is, is the issue of wave particle paradox and the types of concepts that we use to try and model particles. Um, so we simplify our descriptions. Uh, if you can think of this drawing as a representation of the Earth or some kind of other body in space, right? We say, you know, the, there's often the joke about, the, about, about physicists and spherical chickens, right? Making approximations of the real world to the point of absurdity, right? Um, so we're using simplified approximations almost all the time. Um, and of course, oversimplification has its limits. Um, you know, from certain perspectives, things can be deceptive, right? So we talk about this issue of people thinking that the Earth is flat or that, uh, you know, that you're living on a planar surface when really it's curved. You know, locally it looks flat, but in reality it's globally curved. Um, so I'm just playing with ideas here a little bit. Um, you know, over time though, once you start with some basic model that works pretty well, you find that uh, Really, there are anomalies and problems and refinements that need to be made. So, you know, that the world isn't flat, it has topology, it isn't really round either, you know, it has um, some kind of shape. <clears throat> so, um, sort of to re reiterate what I said before, the, the simple ball like description of things like the Earth or the Moon or other planets, um, it's definitely wrong but it still works to first order, and it works across different scales, right? And, and so in that sense, we often think of atomic systems as being composed of things that behave somewhat like balls-ish. Um, <clears throat> and when we talk about balls, um, you know, we, in physics, we like to think about things like systems like billiard balls, because it's a, an ideal system. You know, the pool balls have been manufactured so that they're uniformly smooth and round, and so when they bounce off of each other, or the walls, <coughs> they uh, obey um, simple mathematical pro you know, uh, functions, so you get rid of surface irregularities and things like that. Um, <coughs> you know, and, and in that sense, you know, the behavior of gases has been thought of in some sense in this way. You can think of atomic species as small balls bouncing around, or maybe barbells, or some other geometry, right? And so um, your uh, um, your gas model uh, changes and needs to be modified to accommodate these kinds of things, but more or less, um, you know, it gives you some kind of feel for what temperature means within that context. And so, particle models and particle-like approaches have been, you know, maybe not dominant in physics, but certainly r really well represented. Right? Um, <clears throat> crystals can be thought of as arrangements of of particle-like atoms, and so um, the symmetries associated with crystals. Um, are a, sort of a direct consequence of this particles as ball-like things paradigm, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, but these uh, crystalline arrangements then give rise to a whole other phenomenon, right? You can have uh, oscillations and variations which propagate through the crystal lattice. Now we're talking about phonons and the other sorts of uh, quasi-particle, quantized wave sorts of uh, formulations which have developed. And so, you know, when people talk about uh, waves, you know, you can think of water waves or um, electromagnetic waves, and certainly, you know, I have a little uh, illustration here of the models that people tend to show for photons or a monochromatic plane wave of light, right? So there's, we don't draw strong distinctions between individual photons and groups of photons sometimes, I think, but um, this model is maybe problematic because where do the ends of the wave go? I mean, it's, does it carry on forever into infinity? That seems sort of weird. But, yeah, somebody has conceptualized a photon packet as being something more like this, and I don't know that, I'm not arguing that I think that that's the right way to think about it, but I think it's sort of an interesting approach. Um, and But on the subject of light, what makes, you know, light so interesting and other particles as well is that you know, it can be equally well described as either a wave or a particle, or a wavicle, perhaps, as some jokers called it, right? But, you know, what's a waving particle or a particling wave? That's sort of a, you know, our, our, all of our descriptions are breaking down this, this description of paradox. 
Um, but it seems that well established that both properties are inherent. It's not a misapprehension. Um, and so, um, you know, it, yeah, it extends beyond photons, as I mentioned. So you can think of it in terms of uh, atomic systems. We had early models like uh, De Bro or the Bohr model, where you have something like spherical orbits. Um, and then there's a relationship between that and uh, de Broglie's approach, where these orbits correspond to well, waviness. I mean, in that sense, the Bohr model invokes quantization sort of for no obvious reason. Um, the de Broglie approach demands quantization due to the wave nature. Um, so, uh, you know, beyond that, we realize that. Uh, if you are not sure whether or not you want to call it a particle or a wave, but you think about things in terms of a probability distribution, then the math already existed to describe these things. So spherical harmonics are there. We have these functions. And that sort of falls into place as a, as a useful means of approaching this. Um, so there are some things which are kind of strange. I mean, ENM, electromagnetic theory, works great, but where does charge really come from? I mean, it posits charge from the beginning as a thing and says, here's positive charge, here's negative charge, or sources and sinks, etc. But it doesn't really explain a mechanism for how those are created in the first place. Um, and then, you know, we talk about mass as well. There are questions, you know, is inertial and gravitational mass the same thing, or um, are we having two different kinds of mass? Um, our current uh, theory of everything is supposed to be beautiful. And, you know, uh, hopefully you've seen this well-distributed uh, chart showing the particles and interactions in the standard model. So, uh, in that sense, it's thinking of lots of little balls inside of bags. And so, if you're thinking in terms of our conceptions, the standard model is an attempt to force the particle-like approach onto the phenomena of subatomic species. We're saying, here are these little things we've detected through collision experiments. It has a grain-like nature to it. Since we think in terms of grains now, we need to explain these grains. You need gluons to hold the grains together, right? So now you have this quark-gluon plasma, so-called. Um, you know, and so this is nothing to speak of the alternatives to the standard model, like string theory, loop quantum gravity, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the fact that these exist illustrate that there's a certain dissatisfaction with this sort of approach amongst parts of the physics community over the last 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> so I won't say too much about the standard model exactly. Hopefully anyone who's viewing and has taken it on their own time to become familiar with the way in which that describes things. But um, I guess I'm arguing here that what if there's some other concept or other model which could be used to make sense out of the stuff that we find in physics experiments. And I think there's an idea which is not new, but has been somewhat overlooked, sometimes called Kelvin's beautifully wrong idea. So I have a picture of a smoke ring here so that uh, you can see that. So a smoke ring is a vortex of a sorts, right? So you have a high concentration of smoke particles, and that form propagates and persists through time, right? Not perfectly, not well. Eventually it will decay and turn into other things, but um, in some sense, all matter and light is persisting in form through time. It doesn't from moment to moment change what it is. And I think that's sort of the key of Kelvin's idea. So if we go back to 1867, um, <clears throat> Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, um, was at a royal uh, philosophical society I'm meeting, I believe. I, I might be mixing up exactly what the name of their group was called. but. Uh, he, he was observing a series of smoke rings. So they had a cool machines or someone was really good at blowing smoke rings. I think they actually developed a couple boxes with membranes which allowed you to fire smoke rings. People still build these sort of smoke ring guns for fun. Um, but these guys must have been going nuts because he noticed that these smoke rings were hitting each other and then bouncing off of each other and maintaining their form. So it's, uh, you know, basically they're sort of acting like particles in a larger way, even though it was a, a construct made in the, you know, Navier-Stokes equations of the fluid flow of the air. Um, and so he, at the time, uh, you know, while people were talking about atoms, not everyone even really agreed that atoms existed, but he thought if they existed and they were fundamental, maybe they were made of knots. And uh, some of the argues uh, or sorry, arguments <coughs> made for that is that knots have 
stability and identity. So uh, the topology of a knot is what it is, and it's different from other things. There are a variety of these typologies to describe a variety of types of stuff. In his case, he was thinking of atoms. The vibra vibrations can be sustained on the knots. So there's inherently a wave-like nature because the snake's biting its own tail, so to speak. Um, and then there's a possibility of transmutation. So the process of changing topology uh, can potentially turn one thing into another. Um, so a number of things developed out of this. Tel Kelvin's ideas really spawned all of knot theory, which is a, considered a subfield of topology. Um, some of the first things they did were classify the types of moves you were allowed to make in knot theory. And uh, the Reidemeister moves are uh, maybe the most important. They're move one, so calling a twist and an untwist. Uh, move two is sort of just sliding this unrelated strand over or under um, another strand. And move three actually has some interesting relationships to the Yang-Baxter equation. Lewis Kaufman's written a lot about this sort of thing. And so, But the, the problem maybe with these knots is that, uh, well, and maybe I'll talk about this more later, but move one is not maybe as specific as you'd like. It turns out that if something is twisted over itself, there's some internal writhe here, that by undoing it and without maintaining a term to keep track of that writhe, you're probably losing something. But anyway, these moves can be used to classify knots, and so they started to classify what they call prime knots, sort of like prime numbers. And so in the upper left, you can see um, some of the first series of prime knots which they identified. Oops, sorry about that. So the simple ring or loop or vortex, uh, <coughs> simplest unknot, is uh, it is what it is. It's a torus of, of sorts, although the radius is perhaps ill-defined. Um, again, since they were using string, they had maybe a different approach to make in, in terms of identifying these constructs. Um, the trefoil knot here, they call three sub one, and it should be noted that there's also a, a mirror version of this. If you exchange the sort of the sign of all these crossings, you get a left-handed version of this. Uh, four one here is the figure eight knot, and so this has four crossings rather than three. It is its own mirror image. Just one interruption. Do you have a pointer or anything that you can? Yeah. Uh oh, that's yeah. going to make it a lot better. Okay. You should have pointed that out originally, and go a little slowly so that they can they can see where your point is. Okay. We'll go. Um, thanks, Jim. Maybe you could back up just a little bit to the prime knots, because then er. start where where you were explaining the the, um, the transformation one from one knot to another. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry. With your pointer. That's it. That's it. Right. So that becomes more of a lecture. Yeah. Right. So Reinemeister one is here, and that's really I think the most important one to pay attention to in the future. Uh, context of what we'll be talking about, in the context of what we'll be talking about. Um, so they uh, started to, well, Peter Guthrie Tate uh, comes into this a lot. He was uh, one of Kelvin's um, s s cohorts and really seemed to believe in this idea and thought that by figuring out knots, they'd be able to figure out atoms. And so they spent a lot of time trying to figure out knots. But over time, it became very clear especially with the adoption of the periodic table, um, that the relationship, there's no obvious correlation between prime knots and atoms. Um, and so the two fields diverge significantly. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that anyone has ever really co tried to compare these knot structures to the types of so-called fundamental particles that you find. And when I say fundamental, I think of that word differently than I think most um, particle physicists do. Fundamental to me means uh, more stable or um, more primitive, you know. So, you know, well, that'll make more sense here in a minute. So, a quick note of the timeline of where we started to find these particles, some fundamental, some less so. So, in uh, just before the turn of the century, the electron was discovered and understood. And, and there was a lot of work in, in terms of radioactivity at this period. And so um, eventually people started to realize that these uh, beta rays were in fact, or beta radiation and cathode rays and electrons were all the same thing. <clears throat> um, we discovered uh, protons, neutrons, 
positrons, muons, and uh, pions and kaons in that order up until the 50s. And then things started to get really chaotic because we started to make better and better accelerators that could smash things together and create more and more exotic and yet fairly uh, unstable stuff. And so this is the so-called particle zoo that people talk about. Now in the mid 60s, um, Ray Gell-Mann and others, and George Zweig in some sense, proposed uh, something that they called quarks. And they said that uh, if you had three different kinds of quarks, you could explain what all that stuff was made of. And uh, <clears throat> this idea I don't think was taken really seriously until the mid-70s when uh, additional experiments showed something that people concluded illustrated uh, a type of behavior they hadn't seen before and so we added a new quark with the J or Psi particle and uh, we've occasionally added extra quarks as needed from there. <clears throat> now, um, so something that I thought was interesting is that uh, in some sense, people are talking about similar ideas in, in different contexts. There's something called the Good Judgment Project, and that, <laughs> I forgot that I added this in this presentation, but, but it's shown that um, intelligent people with connections to the internet can uh, more accurately predict outcomes than uh, CIA agents with access to privileged information. Not everyone, not all the time, but on average, at an aggregate, if you look sort of broadly enough, you'll find uh, that people sort of know what they're talking about and um, it's in this case in that case they were using numbers and saying how many migrants would flee over the border during this time or something and you know different people were good at estimating those values and uh, <clears throat> but uh, you can think of applying it to ideas as well and so we're all trying to chase the same elephant but we somebody grabs the, the leg and thinks it's a tree, someone grabs the trunk and thinks it's a snake. Uh, this came out when the J.R. Sy article was published, and I, I came across this poem. It's not very common to find poetry in uh, scientific literature, but it was the, at the end of an article all about uh, surface plasmons, a novel undergraduate experiment. And uh, this gentleman, Roger Clapp, wrote, J.R. Sy, a physicist, physicist's four-footed sonnet. Where is the thing beneath the thing? When can we say we've found it all? Is there an end, or just a string that dangles down like an endless fall? Molecules, yes, and atoms too. Electrons we know, and nuclei. Neutrons, protons, the particle zoo. And enter now the J or Psi. Can we not try to knot the string, to start, start from a bottom and see what grows? Plant us a seed and see what we get. When unity doubles and does its thing, and triples, quadruples, quintuples, who knows? What patterns will show? What world is there yet? Um, this poem haunted me. Anyway, um, there are, the cathedral and the bazaar is a phrase of Ericus Raymond's and it can be thought of in different ways, but in the context of fundamental physics, the cathedral is people with PhDs in particle physics, the guys that work at CERN, uh, anybody who's gotten a Nobel Prize in this sort of thing in the last couple of years, and uh, uh, Higgs and all those guys would be the cathedral. The bazaar is everyone who's interested very, very, very interested in the subject and forbidden from discussing it because they're not trained or considered to be uh, knowledgeable. Usually they're professionals from other fields who are amateurs in the area of particle physics but they feel like they would like to have some input. And um, within both areas, uh, knots show up a lot. Uh, I should have uh, Lewis Kaufman and his Knots and Physics series over here with the cathedral as well. Um, I'm not sure where I put myself, probably in between the two, but <clears throat> if uh, what we're trying to do then is co make a comparison, excuse me, between uh, Kelvin's thought of there's something fundamental about not like stuff and physics as we know it. So we need to start simple and we need to start probably with light. So the simplest knot that isn't nothing at all is the unknot, and, and that, we're not trying to, to reinvent the wheel here. That's the thing, um, and so uh, you know, the unknot. If you imagine that there's some electromagnetic oscillation on top of this, might provide you the kind of characteristics that you need to describe the behavior of photons. Photons have polarization. It's uh, 
Uh, they have a direction of travel, generally assumed to be at the speed of light, unless it's in vacuum, um, unless it's through a medium. And uh, the orientation of the electric field during propagation is what we keep track of and use to define the polarization. And so the torus allows you, or a spinning torus, whose orientation can be changed with respect to its direction of propagation, or maybe some other model. There's a little bit of ambiguity here, and I'm not sure where exactly how you'd want to model this, but, but that gives you what you need to explain left and right-handed circular polarization linear and their middle case elliptical. <clears throat> now, if you're willing to accept that a simple un electromagnetic magnetic unknot might be a model for individual photons, um, this is an attempt to try and find a bridge between this approach and the standard model. Um, and so, really we're thinking about this in terms of phenomenology. So, what do people talk about with quarks? You can't remove a quark from a proton because you'll make new stuff. You'll put so much energy in in the process that new things will come out and stuff will change and life gets confusing. The gluons turn into jets or something, you know, who knows what. But uh, the, the important thing is that these things are inside of the thing. They were determined from scattering experiments. They're, they know that there's something in there, and a scattering experiment can be considered a projection in space. So in scattering, you take a three-dimensional object, you shoot something at it from one direction, that creates something like a shadow, right? So in this process of scattering, you're finding the harder or more dense areas and, and calling them stuff and labeling them quarks, and then we try to come up with labels for it. But think about a knot. So if, if you had some electromagnetic trefoil knot of sorts, and uh, you know there is no one place where the crossings are located within the thing, right? So within the topology of a knot, you can move it around. It isn't in any one place, but it's within the topology of the thing, right? So you can't pull out a crossing and have the knot still maintain its uh, existence without, uh, you know, transmuting it, as it were. Um, so uh, this is where things start to get heretical. You don't, in this sense, need a strong force to talk about why things are holding themselves together inside of these things. Um, so that's sort of weird. And, um, but it gives you an interpretation for antiparticles in that there's a mirror trefoil. So you could have uh, both a left-handed and right-handed trefoil. You call one positive, you call one negative. Uh, they both have a similar mass, but uh, you know, maybe when they interact with each other, something strange happens. Um, I guess this is just a summary of some of the things that I was trying to uh, tell you there. Now, <clears throat> if you're comparing crossings to quarks and trying to say there's a correlation there, um, there's maybe a difference here between how a, 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 an approach like this and the standard model would handle neutrons, because in neutrons, there was an assumption made, and it's hard to make scattering experiments off of neutrons, so I don't know how much individual neutron scattering was done in the early days to determine how many quarks were inside the neutron, but we decided to say there were three. And we said that they were, uh, you know, down, down, up instead of up, up, down, but with one or the other being the proton or the neutron. And that's a cute mathematical trick, but if you look in terms of uh, prime knots, the figure eight knot, it has one more crossing than the uh, trefoil knot. So it's more tangled, it's more massive in that sense. But what's interesting is that the figure eight knot has no writhe. So writhe is what knot theorists, uh, one of the things they use to classify different sorts of knots and knot topologies. And so an unknot has no writhe. It's not twisted at all, it's not tangled. And photons are not charged. So this holds with our experience. Um, the trefoil knot and its mirror image have writhe. In fact, they have writhe of opposite sign, sort of like you'd expect charge to be of opposite sign. But the figure eight knot has no writhe. It's chargeless. Um, it's also its own mirror image. So uh, if you believe that this could be a representation for the neutron, this suggests that there is no such thing as an anti-neutron, and Bruce Cork would be very unhappy if he's still alive. I'm not, I don't really know if he is. I'm um, sorry, Bruce. Um, so, to maybe the part that you're most interested in, Stu, the electron, um, 
we've skipped something, right? So there's nothing in between uh, an unknot and a trefoil knot in the prime table of knots that was developed by Tate and all. But uh, they developed that with the first Rydemeister move without a modification to account for writhe. And subsequently others have modified that first Rydemeister move. And um, when you do that, you find that there's something else that's sort of primish. And that primish thing is sort of a Mobius knot of sorts. So it's topologically very similar to the unknot. In fact, it's so similar that topologists didn't see it as different, and not theorists, excuse me, didn't see it as different. But uh, you have a Mobius, and you have a mirror Mobius, so you can twist it the positive direction or the negative direction, whatever you want to call it, and so that you have a, something which can give you an electron or a positron as needed. It has a little bit of tangledness, so it has something like mass, right? There's something like a crossing there. Um, and it's not a linear relationship between crossings and mass, but... Um, and it gives you... So electrons have spin. You need something that has spin, one half. And uh, this sort of thing is something which you can imagine takes 720 degrees to get back around to where it started again, uh, basically. So something that gives you a, a way to have strange spin. And this is not, in particular, my idea. So Williamson and Vandermark wrote a paper called Is the uh, Electron a Toroidal Photon? or something like that. Um, and they said, you know, if you take that writhing wave model of the uh, electromagnetic field and rather than just sort of attaching it in a loop, they don't want to talk about that much at all, but you give it a half twist and then attach it, you get something like this. And it's interesting because uh, there's a minimal energy confirmation in which all of the fields sort of point in the same direction. So it's, it, 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 there's some something about their description that sort of maybe gives some explanation for why you'd expect to get charge. There's a guy named Hu who uh, talks about a Hubius helix, and he thinks about it rather than being a... He thinks about a, a massless particle moving around this kind of path at the speed of light. And I, I tried... I asked him, what's the difference between a massless particle moving in this path at the speed of light and light moving in this path at the speed of light, and I didn't really get an answer, and I don't really know myself. I mean, it's sort of a, that's a question that I, I don't have an answer exactly to. Um, but if you look at, so look at these comparisons, and I haven't said much about neutrinos, maybe because I'm more hesitant about it, but if you imagine that you can entangle these things, and that they don't like to just intersect all the time, that uh, a neutrino or, or neutrinos can be forms of linked light, a muon would be something like a photon linked to an electron so that when it pulls out it has to separate as a neutrino, it can't separate as a photon. So, um, And this gives you some idea for beta decay. I was always told as a child that there's not a proton and an electron inside of a neutron. So even though beta decay would like you to believe that that's an end neutrino. So even though beta decay sort of would like you to believe that that might be the case, um, you know, if you squint funny, if you sort of cut a line through this this figure eight knot and reconnect each of the sides, you'll see that the top part turns into one of these and the bottom part sort of turns into a, uh, a single twist. So you can imagine a vortex reconnection description for beta decay and there, there you go, weak force. I don't know if you need that anymore. <coughs> so um, this system gives you a pretty easy and simple correlation between the basic and more stable, more regularly encountered particles that we see. And it gives you something that you can imagine being used to describe the more complex and uh, quickly decaying stuff that we see. Um, so as this has been presented, it's undoubtedly a drastic oversimplification beyond sort of topological mathematical intuitions. I haven't presented here any attempts to map E and M on top of these things, but I think that that can be done, and I have some thoughts about how you might go about doing that. Um, so, uh, here's some points for summary, but I th think that uh, in general, I'm ready for whatever questions you guys have.